And I'm going first because I've got a couple of boring academic type slides at the front, which you would expect from an economist, to stimulate thought, if nothing else. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of issues uh, within the livestock sector, or the ruminant livestock sector that we have currently, just to challenge you to think about um, what's happening in the world and what should perhaps be happening in the world and what is needed to make some of these changes take place. What I also hope to do in conclusion is that I will demonstrate to you that measurements of efficiency and the debate of efficiency is anything but simple. So let's start off and the immediate question uh, that I had when I started to put this presentation together was to simply ask myself, what is efficiency? It's a word we hear an awful lot about. Uh, it's a word that had probably drifted off the agenda slightly over the past few years. So let's just ref refresh ourselves as to what we think efficiency is about. Um, and I did, when I sent an email to Kath, I put a number of things down there. And of course, we can finish up talking about sustainability in a circular economy. And probably we could finish up talking about sustainability and a circular economy in the same breath as we talk about efficiency. But I'm not going to do that unless it comes along later. So what is efficiency? Let's start from the basic, the basic building block. It's about input and it's about output. And I'm building up a very simple model here where the red line <coughs> is the input and it's actually a straight line. So for every extra element of input I've put into the business, I am getting a response in the output, which is a blue line. You'll notice that the blue line bears no resemblance to the red line. So we immediately have two very different patterns at play. It's also about costs and revenues. And all I've done here is I've converted the input into a cost and the output into a revenue. Again, the lines have sort of similar patterns. But that's our basic starting point in relation to efficiency. It's all about inputs and outputs. It's all about costs and revenue. Now, we can look at a thing called technical efficiency. And all I've done on this chart is I have plotted the extra amount of output that you've got for putting one extra amount of input in. So over this period... Touch screens. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch the screen. Over the first three moves there, you can see that for each extra unit of input I'm putting in, I am getting a bigger response. Once I've gone past three, then the response from putting that extra input in is starting to tail away. So I could argue the most technically efficient element in this profile is to work with three units, because that's the point where I have got the maximum benefit from adding an extra unit in. Now, being an economist, I tend not to work that way. I tend to work this way, where I talk about economic efficiency. And again, like all good economists, we move one thing at a time and we make an awful lot of assumptions. So the assumption is that the marginal cost is a flat 15 units, 15 pounds. So for every extra unit of input you put in, it's costing you 15 pounds. And the extra revenue you get obviously relates to the extra amount of, bit of, of, of activity that you've got. And what the economists will tell you to do is to produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Just to be boring for a minute, that means that if I step beyond that point, the extra revenue I get is less than the amount of money I put in. Up until that point, the extra revenue I've got is greater than the extra cost I put in. So in crude terms, it's putting something into the bottom line of my business. Once you've crossed over MR equals MC, then I'm pulling away from the bottom line of my business. What you quickly notice is that economic efficiency is at four and a half units and technical efficiency is at three units. So the first challenge we have when we start talking about efficiency is are we talking about technical efficiency or are we talking about economic efficiency? And the two are very different. 
and I'll maybe illustrate that a little bit further on. So that's one of the wee boring bits. What drives efficiency? Just things for you to think about. Clearly technical competence, because we have a technical boundary. Again, if you go back to the building blocks, there is a theoretical boundary of technical performance. And we might not actually be hitting it, as I'll illustrate further on. So the first thing that affects efficiency is basically technical competence. And what drives technical competence? The appliance of science, having a research base, which we're very fortunate in Scotland to have a research base, and having knowledge transfer, having meetings like this to share ideas and share thoughts. The other thing that drives efficiency, I would argue, is economic competence. And that means things like negotiating skills. The guy who's supplying fertiliser might tell you that he's got a price for your fertiliser, but if you're skilled at negotiating, you may well be able to get the price down a little bit. That will have an impact on your cost structure. And another element that I've just put there is understanding your market. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So we finish up with something like this, where I've got an original... Here's my... It's <laughs> going to irritate the life out of me. The blue line is that original marginal cost, marginal revenue exercise. So for my existing business, my ex existing skills level, my existing knowledge, it's the blue line. I can drive economic efficiency, I can drive technical efficiency by all of these things. And what I'm doing is I'm moving the blue line to the green line. So my, red, my original revenue has gone up a little bit, and um, my, chest, my point of break even has gone up a little bit. So there is efficiency within your existing knowledge base, and there's efficiency within your improved knowledge base. And the only way you get from blue to green is doing some of these things that are listed on the, on the left here. <coughs> Technical knowledge, research base, and so on and so forth. So that's a little bit about um, what I mean about efficiency. And I'm going to make no bones about it. I mean economic efficiency. Our farmer may well have a slightly different perception on, on to where, it, where he lays his, his greater emphasis in the first instance. But let me move on. And in terms of driving efficiency, one thing that, that I think increasingly we have to recognise is what is it that's under our control? And we often have little control over the selling price. Yes, we can do a little bit marginally, and I'll, I'll illustrate that further on. But obviously, the, uh, often the biggest degree of control as businesses we have is in the production efficiency. So, let's have a look at a couple of production efficiencies from the red meat sector to illustrate what I'm thinking about. And this is a slide that really well worried Kath when she saw it, because she just read Scottish deaths. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually on-farm deaths of cattle. And it's a profile, it's the seasonal profile of on-farm deaths in Scotland. The red line is 2013, and the first time we looked at this was in that bad weather of 2013 when people started asking QMS and others, what's the impact of the weather? What effect has it had on our businesses? And that was the effect it had had on our businesses. Much, much increased mortality levels, followed by slightly lower mortality levels in the autumn. If I was going to be really cynical, if they were going to die in a the year, they died early rather than late. The other thing that chart does, remember this is the, the livestock, the, the, the cattle industry, is it shows the challenge that you have in the spring when the calving is going on and the challenge you have in the autumn when you're often weaning your livestock. And if you just think about it, the first thing you do is you take a calf off its mum. You stress the life out of it. The next thing you do is you take it out of a field and you stick it in a shed an environment that it is not familiar with. You probably stress the life out of it again. 
And one thing that often happens when you get stressed, whether it is you as an individual or an animal, is you catch every known thing going. How many of us catch a cold the minute we sort of stop rushing around? How many of us seem to catch a cold when we're actually, you know, at a tired and you know, most tired and such like thing? Same in livestock. However, ignore that waffle for the time being. What you'll notice is there's a degree of consistency beyond uh, 2013. So that set me to think about efficiency in the business. Because what that is telling me is that an animal has been born that has the capability of delivering revenue for me. And it won't do that if it's dead. So let's have a look at it this way. On average, over the past five years, 568,000 calves have registered each year in Scotland. That's 100%. Nearly 32,000 die before they are a year old. Now, these are calves that have been registered. I won't bore you with the ones that don't even get registered. In other words, die, are born dead. 5.5% of all the calves born each year die before they're a year old. Another 1% dies between 1 and 2 years old. Now, with the best one in the world, anything under 2 years old has probably made no financial contribution to your cattle business. 7% in round terms have contributed nothing. They've cost me to get on the ground, etc. I've kept it for a year and it still died. And then we go beyond two to three years, another 1%, over three years, a 5.5%. Now, some of those over three years will have contributed to your business because they've almost certainly have had a calf. Then you add in barren cows, typically 5%. And then you add in something for the cows born dead but not registered. You add all that lot up, 9, 10, 15, 20. That's nearly 20% of all the calves or all the potential calves that are contributing nothing to your business. Surely there is something in relation to the efficiency of our businesses to be thought about in relation to that. And again, I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So that's one theme. That's one theme. Another theme that we have is this spiky weed chart here, which is the age at which animals are slaughtered. Prime cattle um, coming into the abattoirs, the age at which they're slaughtered. That doesn't mean too much. So let's have a look at this one. This is a linear plan over the period, 2010 to 2015. So actually... The males have become younger at point of slaughter. Now that, to me, is a good news story. For a number of reasons. Obviously, if it's, a, what is it there, maybe, let's say, 20 days younger over the period, that's 20 days less um, methane emissions, if we start talking about carbon sustainability and so on and so forth. It's, all more, it's also 20 days quicker than delivering the money to me. And so on and so forth. The, the, the females have gone a little bit older and we could, we could spend time exploring that. I don't particularly want to. It's not the theme of the next theme that I want to, want to illustrate. What I've done here, though, is I've looked at age and I've looked at the weight the animals die at and they divide one by the other and I've got a very crude measure of dead weight added per day that the animal was alive. And we'll change that into linear lines and what you find when you look at that is that the animals have got younger they've got bigger so the daily growth rates have increased bingo let's have a wee celebration we're being incredibly efficient we're producing bigger animals in a shorter period of time that must be efficient we could debate but let me just park it at that point. That must be efficient. However, have we become efficient in the right way? Because what has happened if I move away from the farm and I move to the abattoir, what you find over the past decade 
is that here you've got roughly 7% of all the animals killed in this particular abattoir were over 400 kilos live weight, sorry, carcass weight. And a decade later, let's call it 20% for round numbers. Now, is that efficient for the abattoir operator? This is what the consumer actually picks off the supermarket shelf. And here, I shall read it for you, is a £3 Tesco beef ribeye steak. It weighs 173 grams, and it looks like that. And here is a £3 Tesco beef ribeye steak that weighs 173 grams. No, I'm going to stick my head in the noose here. All those in favour of picking up the one on the left of the screen, raise your arm. One, two. All of those in favour of picking up the one on the right hand of the screen, raise your arm. One, two, three, four, five, seven. You, you've been outdone. Okay, that's a very crude straw poll. But if we're going to sell meat, we want people to pick it off the shelf. And you've just illustrated to me in here that the majority of you would pick that. And I suspect the ones who didn't have looked at the level of marbling in it and think it's too fat. That, I'll tell you now, will eat superbly because it is marbled. But don't get me started on that debate. <laughs> the point is that that has come off a carcass of about 350 kilos and that will have come off a carcass of about 420 that is unacceptable to the retail, the majority of the retail trade. So what has happened in this scenario here is that instead of having 7% of the throughput of their abattoir that they're selling into a commodity low value market, this abattoir now has 20% going into that wider commodity market. And the difference between... Um, Sorry, the difference between these sort of products in terms of wholesale price can be four or five or six kilos uh, pounds per kilo. So what I'm saying in this respect is we have driven efficiency in our livestock production system and gone towards bigger carcasses and so on and so forth. But in terms of economic return to the farmer, we've got ourselves into a position where we aren't delivering what the consumer wants. Now, just a couple of slides just to finish off with in relation to technical benchmarks. And the one observation I would make in terms of anything that we do in farm management, if you don't measure it, you've no way of knowing where you are, you've no way of knowing where your improvements can come from. This is just a look at some of the simple technical benchmarks in relation to four enterprises, four livestock producing enterprises, um, they're drawn out of our latest enterprise costing booklet, and this is sort of the average level of performance and I just want to click those in, in relation to the red column there. I was saying to somebody else, I should have done the first column in red and the second column in black because the, the first column tends to be negative margins and the ones in red tend to be positive margins. However, what you'll see there is very quickly the differences in technical efficiency that these guys are achieving in the red column. Barren cows, typically a couple low. Cows born dead, typically one less than the usual, than the, 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 the average. Cows died before weaning, typically one less before weaning. The cows rearing percentage then, so the amount of cattle that each cow has each cow produced, is a couple of three to four units higher. And they're doing all this with a lower replacement rate. They're doing all this with um, lower feed use as well. So these guys, you, you can... If we go back to sort of simple benchmarks that we have, we're saying that the black guys are not technically efficient. Neither are they economically efficient. You can argue whether the red guys are technically efficient, but they're certainly further up that profile that I showed you at the start than the columns are. So if there's a message there, it's record. Record what you're doing so at least you can look 
and how you've progressed from one year to another but much more than that you can look and see how you've progressed against your peer groups so that concludes my little bit about technical and economic efficiency hopefully i've set a few thoughts uh, alive in your in your mind <laughs>